This is Elocution with your host, Elo Black. Hey pals, on this episode of Elocution, I have a very special guest, actress and author Tina Sloan. Tina recently released her first fictional novel called Chasing Cleopatra, and the audio version of Chasing Cleopatra dropped just a few days ago. Here's a quick little snippet. I choreographed a life that kept me safe and looked so normal to those on the outside. I lived alone in a spectacular, breathtakingly beautiful house. I had work I loved and was very glamorous. I surrounded myself with wonderful people who enjoyed me but would not get too close. No one knew what I was not letting in. Then, in a day, no, in an hour, everything changed. Again, that's an excerpt from Tina's new book, Chasing Cleopatra. We're going to talk about that today. I met Tina years ago at a cocktail party when we both lived in New York City. And she was charming, kind, and very funny. She was hysterical. I remember she couldn't stay at the party long because she had other engagements, but I remember telling my friends that were still at the party that I was sad that she left because I'd only talked to her for a few minutes, but I already missed her. Jim Henson had a quote that I'm paraphrasing, there needs to be a word for old friends that have just met. A week later, I went to a writer's forum. It was in a big, huge mall of a bookstore, and I had stopped to get coffee at this little overpriced nook before the forum started. And while I was standing in line, I felt a whap on my shoulder, and I kind of winced and turned simultaneously because every moment in New York is a brand new day. And as I turned, I saw Tina grinning ear to ear and she said i wanted you to be able to tell your friends that you got slapped by a soap opera star so of course i posted that about five minutes later and we've been pals ever since tina sat down with me to talk about her career her family her friends and her extraordinary life let's take a listen and welcome to the elocution podcast i'm your host elo black and with us today is a fantastic fantastic actress writer mother grandmother tina sloan tina thank you so much for being with us today well i I thank you for having me with you today i'm sitting on this island where it's all windy and dark out and it's just wonderful to be sitting talking to you on the phone like this tina you have such a vast career let's just jump right in tell me tina how did you start in the career of acting was it commercials broadway plays I always wanted to be an actress. My parents did not think that was the proper thing for me to do. So I went to normal college and I got married normally. And then I married someone who was a playwright and I got a little tiny part in his play. And fortunately, Ford Model Agency came to see it and called me the next day and sent me on a commercial. And it was for Head and Shoulders. And I booked the first commercial they sent me on. So of course, they thought I was valuable property. And I really did do so many commercials. I just loved it. I had more fun rondering around New York City from ad agency to ad agency. And you started making all these friends that you'd see at all the same auditions and who are still, two of them are still among my closest friends. But we'd go pop in, do a commercial audition, go home, book it. There were five of us that just almost had all of them for our era, our age group. We had a group meeting that we'd, oh, this is so interesting in in as much as Me Too came along. Uh We'd meet every Thursday after around five or six o'clock and have tea or coffee. None of us had children at that point. One of us did. And we'd talk about our auditions and we'd say, I might say I'm going to blank to see blank tomorrow for an audition and everyone say, watch it. <laughs> be careful. He's a mess. And so you'd know and you'd be prepared and you'd walk in and say, oh, my husband's right outside waiting for me. So will we be done quickly? You know, you'd have yourself prepared. We really, really helped each other mm-hmm. through all of that time because that was the 60s. So think about it then. There was no Me Too movement. There was no even thought of it. So we all protected each other. Right. And commercials weren't bad. They really weren't. But there were moments, as there are in anything, that I remember I was on in Pittsburgh doing a commercial. And the man who owned the company <laughs> had asked me to dinner. And I said, love to come. And I then asked the other actor, not knowing what he was up to. And he said, well, I know I asked you. And I said, well, I asked him the husband in that commercial and we all went to dinner but then he called me when I got back in my room and you can imagine so I remember I put a chest in front of my door I moved the chest and put it in front of my door you know none of us complained we just took care of us right 
Matter of fact, I was just over speaking at St. Andrews in Scotland last year. Uh A women's group asked me to speak, and they wanted me to talk about what it was like in our era when there was no rules or regulations about anything. And I said to them, I said, we never whined, we never complained, but boy, did we take care of it. We just, you know, we smashed somebody on the head. I mean, you just moved them out of the way. You didn't put up with it unless you wanted to. And I'm not saying that there are times when women have to. I mean, they need to keep their job because they're supporting their kids and Mm -hmm. their husband working. So there are obviously exceptions, and I knew when some of them were going on, and that was fine. I didn't, you know, you have to do something you have to. I certainly got off of commercials there, didn't I? <laughs> no, no, it's great, Tina. But let's talk about your first role. Now, there's a story that I want you to tell. It's one of my favorite stories about Search for Tomorrow and the airplane scene. Now, were mm-hmm. you cast as a character, as the no. character Patty Barron no, no, no. at that time? No, good heaven, no. This was probably 10 years before then. I got my first part as an extra on the show. And an extra means you have no line. And I arrived that day. I was going to be in a scene in an airplane. And I arrived and the director took one look at me and he said, you look like you talk. I don't want one word out of you on that airplane. And I said, (laughs) okay. And so we get into the airplane and you see these men outside walking back and forth with these cardboard clouds. So it looks like we're flying, you know. And other (laughs) men are sort of moving the plane a little bit to feel like you're flying and we're supposed to be flying at 20,000 feet. And so I get into my seat, which is all by myself. And let me remind you, this is live television. So it went from where they're filming it right out into the audience. There's no taping like there is today. This sure. Was, this was in the days when it was fun. And you could, you know, if you made a mistake, you made a mistake. But you also couldn't ask for a line or you couldn't say, hey, I'm up, which is what we could say later. You just had to keep going because they're filming it. it was, they were only 15 minutes at that point. Uh-huh. So we're on the airplane and cardboard clouds are going by all of a sudden I feel a tapping on my shoulder and I turn around it was the lead actor and obviously he had forgotten his lines because he said well how are you today and I went "Mm -hmm, mm -hmm." I'm not allowed to speak a word remember the director told me Uh and he said he taps me again he said excuse me I asked how you were and I went "Mm -hmm, mm -hmm." you know and I I guess my face was terrified and he said it's pretty bumpy up here at 17,000 feet isn't it (laughs) I went "Mm mm-hmm and then he said, hey, when we get down, I'd like to take you out to dinner. And I stood up. I turned around and said, excuse me, but this is my stop. And I proceeded to walk off the plane at 17,000 feet into the cardboard clouds. And that director was apoplectic. He's glaring, screaming. I mean, nobody can believe it. So all the cameramen are just almost on the floor. And the lead actor, I don't know what happened. They must have gone to black. I have, I've never thought about it. I went out of there so fast. But I was known for a while as Blondes Away. Oh, yeah. I remember you telling me that. Yeah. Yeah, now, away. Didn't you say that on a show that you were on, people were still talking about that moment in front of you and to you, not knowing that that was you? No commercial people would, they knew it was me. They'd be telling their, if I went in for an audition after that, for a commercial audition, I'd walk in and I'd know that they had just told the story because all the people were still laughing and trying not to laugh when I walked in. I usually made a joke and I said, oh, I made it to the ground without a parachute. I don't know what I said, right. but I'd always say, try I to love- say something funny <laughs> so they'd get over it. But people love to tell the story to their client. You know, it's a way to tell your client, oh, the next actress, let me tell you about her. <laughs> right. But still, I mean, you made an impression and that is brilliant, by the way. I mean, I know you were in a panic situation, but okay, pal. It's like I'm on a bus. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> no, it was 10 years later or so, for at least six or seven or eight. Oh, it must have been 10 that I became Patty. And Nobody how... remembered, and I never told them. Absolutely. So you were on the soap opera Somerset. I actually found a clip on YouTube of Somerset. I didn't see you on it, but I was really, really thrilled because Somerset had... <laughs> The organ music, the soap opera organ music. I was so thrilled by that. (laughs) It was the best show, Ello. It was just absolutely wonderful. I mean, all the actors were fabulous. As I said, it was my first audition and I got it. And I was playing this woman, Kate Cannell, who was the publisher of the newspaper. The first thing she did was to fire her, the man who becomes her husband, to fire Joel Crothers, who was a fabulous actor, uh-huh. who was the editor of the paper. Was, and then she broke up his relationship with Eve, who was the star of the show. She was really wicked and I loved playing her. I just loved it. I mean, I'd have on a fur coat with nothing but lingerie underneath it. And no, no, it was in those days you wore fur coats you know it was a whole different time with lingerie absolutely yes i mean that's what you did (laughs) um (laughs) she was just 
strong and powerful and told everybody what to do. Oh, she was so much fun. And, okay, after her, oh, I know, I ended up in a straitjacket because I was the first woman on television to have an abortion. I mean, not me, Tina, but the character. Yeah, sure. So, of course, she had to be punished. So she went insane and was put in a straitjacket. And that was the end of my time on Somerset. But Joel Crothers, who'd played my husband, had been in Africa. And he came back and he said, I want her back. I want her back right now. You cannot have let her go. So they were going to bring me back. But the day before a search for tomorrow called and asked me to be Patty Whiting. Oh, I know what happened. I auditioned for it. And I don't remember the audition at all. But Betty Buckley, who's a great friend of mine, was up for it, too. I got it. So about six months later, she sends me eight roses. And she said, yes, Tina, you keep searching for tomorrow. I found that eight is enough. Oh, she wow. Said, you know, eight is enough. Isn't that funny? That is great. <laughs> no, it was really cute. Yeah. <laughs> Eight is Enough with the Eight Children, the show from the 70s. Right. Fantastic. Right. right. That's right. And Kevin Klein was on the show then. And there were a lot of really great, well, Peter Simon, Courtney, a lot of wonderful actors were on that. And Mary Stewart, who was the queen of soaps at that point. Uh-huh. And you played Patty Barron. And Mary okay. Stewart was your mother on the show? Yes. I was Mary's daughter, Patty. I never heard the word Barron before. I don't know where you got that one. I got it from IMDb. Sorry if it's not accurate. It just said no, the, it is. the character. I want to say Whiting. I can't remember. I think I came on to bring on the granddaughter, my daughter, who was a granddaughter. And I came for six months to bring her on the show so that Mary would have somebody younger, but not somebody my age younger. I mean, I was probably 30-something at the time, which made Mary feel too old. So I brought her granddaughter, my daughter, who was probably 10 or 12. And then Mary could talk to her and people would think, oh, that's her daughter. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, I get that. The vanity okay. of all of us. I think that's what that was about. But mm -hmm. I knew I was coming on just to bring her on, which I did. And I had a really fun time on that show for, I guess, six months. I think that was my contract. And then I went to Another World, right, when Paul Rausch was producing it as Dr. Olivia Delaney, where I played a Nobel Prize winning cardiologist. Boom. Think about it. Nobel Prize winning. I mean, how great was that? And those Amazing. words, I remember one time I asked for a spatula instead of a scalpel. You know, I just, my whole world was not, <laughs> was not very doctory. <laughs> I was okay. much better with the lingerie. But I played this really smart woman. And it, again, I was playing a really fun, strong woman, which I loved doing. Where Patty wasn't. Patty was kind of, oh, yes, mother, dar mother, dear, I love you more than anything, mother, you know. Right. And then you get to Olivia, who's doing transplants of twins, their hearts or something. I mean, I was really quite genius. And then when that was over, that was a short while, too, I went to Guiding Light. And with Guiding Light, Tina, take us back to your audition. So you were on Guiding Light for 26 years. Take us right. back to your audition because what I, I know didn't from... have an audition. What? Betty Ray was the casting person, but Gail Kobe, who was the producer, had been the Somerset producer. And she was involved with Somerset. She loved me a lot. And she said, Tina, I was, I think I was about 38 at the time. She said, would you mind having a daughter who's 20? I said, are you kidding? I'd love to have a daughter who's 20. I just had had a new baby. I'm mean, my first child who was about three. But she said, we need a strong woman to play a weak woman because it's a story of abuse. Bradley Rains, my husband, I was Lillian Rains. Mm -hmm. Bradley was very abusive. I mean, he'd throw me down the stairs. He'd, you know, he'd hurt me physically a lot. And I let him. I was terrified. And he raped my daughter on the, I'm, I keep wanting to say on the soap, on the soap. And so I had to be, I don't know why they think the women who are the mothers of abused daughters are weak, because I'm not sure they all are. I think they don't want to know, but that's a very different thing than being weak. But I didn't know, or I didn't let myself know what he had done until she told me. And then of course they had me kill him. And I went to them. I never forget this. I went to the producer and I said, look, if I kill him, he's dead and I'm in jail and no little girl is going to go and tell their mother the truth. And we have to, because they, they won't have any parents left. They'll be afraid that mommy will kill daddy and mommy will go to jail. So they changed the story and they had us take him for a trial. We went to rape crisis centers, Beth Chamberlain, Judy Evans and I, we went to all these rape crisis centers and really talked about it with these girls who'd been molested by family members. And there are a a lot of them. Mm -hmm. I think in every room, what did they say? One out of 10 has been molested by someone in their family. And I got letters from women who said, I was about to kill myself because my stepbrother and my stepfather were molesting me every day. And I was going to kill myself till I saw that story. And I thought if Beth Rains can get through it, 
I can get through it. Mm-hmm. And she went and told her mother, she said, I'm going to tell my mother like Beth told you, but if her mother didn't help her. So I remember I wrote her and said, go to some home for abused children and get away from that family. I mean, she had to. Right. And I still hear from her. She's now has a partner and they've adopted a child. So wow. I still hear from her as a life because of that. Those stories helped more people. They right. really did. And because and so of I, you, you also reached out to this person who was having this horrible, horrible crisis and helped her with advice and just oh, I got listening. a lot of those letters, a lot of letters. I'd have young girls come to me when they'd see me walking around and say, thank you. And that's all they'd say, but I knew what they were saying. Right. They could see that it was happening and that they could be saved. And if it wasn't the mother, they had to go to someone and talk to somebody and get out of that house. Mm-hmm. You know, that's just, well, it's criminal. Right. Interestingly, and this is why Gail hired me, she just asked me to come do it because she knew I had just played this really strong woman on Another World and on Somerset. Both of them were very strong women. So she knew that's what I was good at. And she was right. If you're strong and you play weak, it's a lot more interesting than if you're a weak person playing weak. And so you're on Guiding Light. You're playing Nurse Lillian Mm -hmm. Rains. Mm -hmm. And I just want to go back for a second, Tina, and let's give a shout out and well wishes to Judy Evans, who I understand is having quite a time right now in the hospital. She out now? Is she out? Okay, fantastic. Well, we wish her I well. I don't know. I you would know. I just I read an article a couple weeks ago saying that she just had a horrible bout. Well, I knew that she fell off a horse, right, and then broke a leg. Went into the hospital, got COVID. They almost had to take her leg off, but then they didn't. And the last I heard, she was on the mend. And we really wish her well. But going back to Guiding Light, you're playing Nurse Lillian. What was your takeaway from those 26 years? You covered so much material, not just just the rape crisis, but you were also, Tina, as Lillian, the first character, I believe, to go through breast cancer right. on That's screen. Right. Can you walk us through that? Year. I found it myself, and because as a nurse, you, after your bath, you check yourself every day. Mm-hmm. And I, I remember it was Christmas time, and there was Christmas music. And I found it, and I went, of course, the next morning to the gynecologist and said, what do you think? And she checked me and she said, yeah, I think you need a mammogram and a sonogram. So I had the first mammogram and sonogram on TV, which means you're naked. So all the guys set their, they were so cute. They set the cameras because they knew just where I'd be having the mammogram, you know, that thing that comes down and squishes you. Sure. They knew where I'd be standing. I mean, I guess they worked it out before I came in. And then they all left the room, which I thought was so sweet. And we did the mammogram. And then we did the sonogram. And of course, indeed, I had a lump and I had to have an operation. But they did it beautifully. I mean, I did see it recently. Somebody sent me that tape. And I, first of all, I weighed about 102 pounds. I looked great. Um, I remember thinking, what a wonderful job. And the cameramen were so cute. And the sound men, if they taped it, they didn't stay in the studio. Don't you think that was adorable? I love that. I mean, because you know, you can be in the studio and pretend you're not looking or whatever, but it would have made me, I wouldn't have been uncomfortable, but I would have been, because I knew them all so well at that point. But, well, um, sure. But somewhere deep inside, I would have been. So when I found out I had it, I remember I didn't want Beth. At this point, it's Beth Chamberlain. If there's a new Beth. Uh-huh. Her name is Beth. Judy Evans left out. I think she was only on the show for about two years. And Beth Chamberlain came in and did a wonderful job for 15 years. I mean, we were obviously very close. I'm the godmother of her son, mm-hmm. who's now only 12. You know, I adored her. I adored both of them. They were both wonderful. Very different. But Beth Chamberlain, I remember saying, I don't want her to come because if she comes, it'll be, all be about her and not about me. Yes. And I said that to Peter, Dr. Bauer, because he wanted me to have somebody there. And so I said, I want you to help me because I was in sort of love with him forever, as every nurse is with the head doctor, right? <laughs> I mean, I played that part like every other woman. And her wife was my great friend. So I go in the hospital. I go under. I have the operation. I come out. And then a few months later, I find another lump. And I go to him. And his wife, in the meantime, Maureen, is so busy with her children and her committees, not making dinner, getting the attention he needs. So he's very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And the blackout happens. And we're somehow in a garage together. And I guess we just sort of kiss a lot. I know we kissed. I know that was, and that for him, he'd been a loyal husband his whole life. And I loved him, but I would never have made something happen if we hadn't had that blackout, I guess. Interestingly, they had me in a beautiful convertible. All of a sudden, I had a BMW convertible on nurse's salary. Um, (laughs) But they needed it to shoot the scene, obviously.
obviously, is a convertible. They couldn't do it with a car. Right. So in the blackout, I mean, I think you could do a car normally, but not in a blackout. So then thinking I'm, I'm going to have it again. I'm really scared of getting cancer again. By the way, before that, during that time, the letters I got when I went through it from women who said, when I went through cancer, I couldn't cry for myself. I was too busy helping my children not worry. I was too busy taking care of my husband. I was too busy with all the things I was doing at home or at work that I could never cry for myself. But by crying for you, I was finally able to cry for myself. Right. Well, I thought that was just terrific. And we went to so many hospitals. I mean, the Sloan Kettering, every single cancer hospital in the world, I think, including flying me over to Italy, gave us wonderful, wonderful praise for that storyline. I mean, it mm-hmm. was it was just beautifully done. I didn't just go in and have it over in a day or a week. It was a year, right. you know, where I'd go to group sessions talking about it, and I would not, I didn't tell anyone. I mean, I just couldn't tell anyone. And then Maureen, my best friend, Dr. Bauer's wife, the one who I fell in love with and slept with once after I thought I was going to die from this cancer. I write a letter. I don't know if you saw the show the other day with Maureen and me. Did you see? You didn't happen to see this. I did. It was a little Skype meeting with all of you. Yeah. Right. And as I said, when I was sitting at the table about Ken Burns, when he had to put in Lincoln's shot that was going to kill Lincoln, even though he knew Lincoln was dead, he couldn't put that shot in because he knew this was going to kill him. Do you know what I mean on right. the PBS series about Lincoln? Uh-huh. Ken Burns simply couldn't put the shot in. And I really had trouble writing that letter because I knew this letter was going to go in her kitchen, insane woman that I am, and leave it on her counters where she'd open it and read it. So I had addressed it to Ed. Why any woman in her right mind would do that, but we had to get that forward in the story so she'd find out right away. So she find, gets the letter that I write after I couldn't write it. I tried and tried and tried and finally she came over and said, oh, Tina, for God's sake, write the letter. We all want to go home. So I wrote it. <laughs> And the guys, the cute crew, I mean, I never caused problems. I always knew my lines, but I just knew that this was going to set off a nightmare. Anyway, I wrote the letter. She reads it. She gets furious at her husband, tells me we are a suburban cliche or whatever, which we were. And she gets so mad at him. She said, I'm going up to the, they had a cabin. And she gets in the car and it's snowing and she drives off a cliff and she dies. And this was mm-hmm. massive because mm-hmm. they had built her character up, Ello, so much in the few months preceding when they knew they were going to do this. The writers knew they were going to do it. They made her so important and so so focused that people were devastated by yes. this. I was devastated. Mm-hmm. And so was Lillian. I mean, as you can imagine, and all the responsibility fell on me. And I kept saying, as I said the other day, Peter was there with me too. Dr. Bauer was. Yeah. It wasn't just me. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Everyone's saying, oh, you poor thing, Ed. And they're going, oh, Lillian, you did it. And I'm thinking, now, wait a minute. Ed did it, too. I would never have been in this mess if it hadn't been for him. Thank you. It wasn't just you sitting in the BMW by yourself. Yeah, and it wasn't just me. He came over to my house with some flowers or something, you know, and that's when we slept together. And I often think that I didn't go to his house. He came to my house. But I'm not, you know, men get away with it somehow, sometimes. Exactly. And if I could pause for just a second, Tina, on this subject, it was a couple of years ago, I found the episode of Maureen reading the letter and Lillian's reaction to finding out that she was killed in the car accident. And I wrote you an email. It was kind of late at night and said, wow, fantastic job. It was great, great acting. Good for you. And you wrote me back. Do you remember what you said? I said, I've never seen it. Yes. I've never seen it. I've never seen any of it. I couldn't. It was just, it was just awful. I mean, it was a nightmare to be the one that was so accused of all of this. Not that I did feel I deserved it. And because I was the character, I really felt I deserved it. And because she was weak as a character, it was even more painful, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. If I'd been a strong character, I would have been, oh, you know, it's not just me, everybody. It's him, too. Let's get this real. She'd been a pain in the neck to him, whatever. But because it was Lillian who, I remember I was brushing with a broom, their entryway or something. I was so pitiful how I was trying to apologize for what I'd done. I didn't do it. She drove off the cliff, but it came down to that letter. I think. Right. Well, I mean, she would have found out. Well, maybe she wouldn't have found out another way unless I put the letter there. So really, the letter. I just couldn't bring myself to watch it. I've never, ever watched those scenes. And I've heard from people that they were just amazing, all of them. For real. Genuine brilliance. And you had never seen it. I went, what? But I get well, exactly what you're saying. I don't think I'll ever, ever watch it. I mean, because it's been off now for 10 years. And that was 10 years before. It's been 20 years almost since that happened. Mm-hmm. And maybe more than that. Tell me what was the fan base reaction oh livid i just saw the other day <laughs> i love tina but i hate lillian and it's been 28 years he said and i think i mean people were absolutely furious with me they'd see me and say how could you have killed her i'd go the writers did it i didn't yeah thank you <laughs> 
But I just say, what can I say except I'm sorry? I mean, I was just saying, oh, I feel this is badly. I don't know what I said. But people did not like it at all. And I mean, it really is interesting, Hello, that it was totally Lillian's fault in everybody's mind. It really is. And the fact that I remember we were having lunch one day and you would mention to me that people would still go up to your table and say, I can't believe you did that to her and walk oh, off. Yeah. And yes, yes. it didn't happen when we were having lunch, but you knew what they were talking about. They knew you knew and they would sure. walk off. And it had been 10 years since the people still were affected by it all of these years later after the storyline, after the show oh, had completely yes. wrapped. Oh, they still are. Well, I mean, there are characters I've seen that I've hated for 20 years for killing somebody that I liked, you know? Right. <laughs> I mean, in a movie even that they've only seen once. This they saw 500 times. They watched all their lives. And they took a character that they really built up to be wonderful. <laughs> And got rid of her. And she said the other day that it was focus groups, remember? Right, right. That the focus groups didn't want her with anybody. And I think they wanted Ed with somebody else. I don't remember who. And so that's what they did. Eve, I think they put Eve with Ed. I mean, it could never be me because of what I'd done. Between us, when we saw each other, it was too hard. Right. right. Although at the end of the show, we, Lillian and Ed became close again. Mm -hmm. It took a year or so for it. More than that, probably. But before I married Buzz Cooper at the end, I went to Maureen's grave and apologized. I said, Maureen, I haven't gone out with anybody because I felt so badly of what happened to you. And I'm now about to marry Buzz and I just want to tell you and I know of all people, you will understand. I wrote it. I, or I remember the idea was mine and I, I didn't write it. Somebody wrote it. I can't remember who. I thought it was Danielle or Jilly, but it wasn't. It was David. And it was wonderful. And I did it in one take because we were out in PPAC and we had no time. And I do see that from time to time. That's the only thing I've seen about the whole situation. So tell me, Tina, with Guiding Light going on, did you guys have any idea that they were about to close up shop? Well, CBS did it. I mean, Ellen was trying, our producer, Ellen Wheeler, was trying to save us by moving us out of the studio into PPAC, where it was one house with different doors. There were about six different doorways, which would one would be rustic, a cabin, one would be a rose-covered cottage, the next one would be a wealthy-looking house. It was brilliant, and we did a lot of it outside, and in the bitter cold snow, she was saving millions for us, and we needed, I think we cost $180 million. A talk show cost, what, $20 million? Right, right. And CBS was the one that took us off. But interestingly, Ello, the night Guiding Light went off, it was a black tie dinner for drug addiction. And I went because a friend of mine was running this anti-drug addiction. And we were about to do on Guiding Light a story about drug addiction with the kids. And I was very involved in helping that get on the air. So the man who's a great friend of Les Moonves by happenstance goes up and says, well, tonight Guiding Light has just gone off the air. You may not know it. People in the audience probably didn't. He said, but Les Moonves, head of CBS, took it off. And Les, Tina Sloan is here. I want you to apologize to her. So he stood up and everybody booed him. Oh, whoa. Whoa. <laughs> I mean, they were joking. Ooh. <laughs> and he did come over and apologize. And he said, you know, I tried to keep it on. I said to him, no, Les, you have your wife and you want her to have a talk show on, on our channel. And I was right. Yeah, the talk. Um, Yes, but it didn't come on right away. They put a stupid game show on so that it didn't look like he went right to his wife. But then she came on. <laughs> Isn't that you know? just crazy? Well, yeah. But, I mean, we were expensive. It was his job to keep things, you know, under control. And so he let us go. But he was very cute that night. And he said, you know, well, of course he was cute. And his wife was next to him in two seconds. Now I know why. <laughs> yeah. I thought he was a wonderful man. I mean, I have a, you know, everybody knows people in different contexts. Sure. In my context, he was just lovely. So when you had Guiding Light is up and done, then tell me about what happened because I'm trying to go into your fantastic memoir, Changing Shoes. Is that when you started well, working on Changing no, Shoes? I started, I started it because I saw a sign in the window and it said, what you make is important. It was a furniture store. And I was writing down things. My parents were in their late 80s, early 90s, and they needed a lot of help. And there was nowhere to read about it, what to do for, because nobody was living to be that age until about 10 or 20 years ago. So I was writing all these things down of how you take care of them, what you have to do, living wills, power of attorneys, all these very practical things. And I saw these two women in the eye doctors and they brought their mother in and then she went in to have her eye exam and she looked quite elderly. And I said, I hope you have power of attorney and living will. It just came out of me. And they said, what are you talking about? And so I told them. And then I realized people don't know about this. Mm -hmm. 
And so I wrote a book starting off with all the practical advice that we all need to know, which I had no idea of and I was learning day by day over about five years of taking care of my parents. Then I thought, gee, we're talking about getting older, but as a soap opera actress, I certainly know how damaging it is to get old. So, you know, and how they help you by the way you dress and how makeup helps and all the little tricks from being in the makeup and hair room and Mm -hmm. on set and all the things that were important to keep going. And I realized that writing this book was important for other people. I mean, I didn't do this for myself so much. I was doing it for those women. And had I had this book, I would have been in such better shape. I knew that. Had I had something I could have opened up to and said, okay, this is what needs to be done. My mother got senility dementia. She would say things like, Tina, the butler stole the silver. And we had no silver and no butler. So I would say, no, he didn't, mom. That's ridiculous. He didn't. And then I learned because I went to her doctors and they said, go along with everything she says. Now, had I learned that five years earlier, it would have made such a difference. Because once I said, let's go try and find it. She was a different person. She was so happy. Mm -hmm. So I put that in the book. And had I known that, I wouldn't have gone through four or five years of just saying, oh, mom, no, that's not sugar, it's salt, or whatever. You know, I wasn't as kind. And then once I learned how to do it, I was kind. I knew how to play with her. And it was sort of fun. I began to enjoy it. Uh Because she never got angry or mad. She was generally the sweetest. She'd smell a rose and she'd say, come smell. And Mm -hmm. I'd smell it. And then two minutes later, she'd say, Come smell. Each time was the first time for her. Yes. And how lucky. How, what a wonderful way to live. Yes, You know, the absolutely. first bite of your cake, is the, and then you take the second bite, and it's the first bite. <laughs> oh, I mean, yes. it was just, yeah, it was terrific. She was very happy. And my father had been wonderful all his life. He was the kindest, best man, totally behind my acting and everything. And he was in so much pain. He had two kinds of cancer that he got grumpy, and I didn't know what to do. So I went to the doctor on the floor where they were living at that point in a assisted living that was so beautiful. I would have liked to have lived there. I'd go have all my food there because it was so good. And the doctor said, what happens when someone's about to die? They get mad at someone who's going to live, especially if that person is taking care of them. Mm-hmm. So the person they're closest to is who they're going to be angry with. But I'm going to talk to your father and tell him he cannot treat you this way. His mind was just genius till he died. And I thought this is something for people to know, that their parents are getting mad at them or their husband or wife or whoever is dying, not because they are mad at them, but because they're mad they're going to live and while they themselves are not going to live. And that was such an eye opener and yes. so helpful. I wanted people to learn all of this, you know, and not yes. have to go through what I went through. So I published that book. No, I didn't publish it. I wrote it and I took it to an agent in New York. And then I, I'd gone to a psychic at some point mm-hmm. and she said the day June 14th, something very important is going to happen. Nothing happened all day. And that evening, two young kids came over to ask me to help them with a theater group that they were starting. I think they wanted money. I forget. But I said, no, I don't want to do that. And the man asked, Andrew Smith, I remember his name, said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to turn my book into a play and go all over the country and do it. And that was the beginning of Changing Shoes. Wow. Had she not said that to me, that psychic hadn't said that, I probably wouldn't have thought what they said mattered. Because she'd said this day is the most important day, I somehow, when I said those words, thought, this is what I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So I went to a friend of mine who was my Shakespeare teacher. I was taking some extra courses at night, adult education. I don't know what it was. Really interesting. But he had a theater group. And I went and his name was Joe Plummer. He's just fabulous. And I said, Joe, will you help me write this play? Because I have no idea how to craft a play. And of course, I'll pay you. So he got on board. He'd come over every night around six and we'd have dinner with my husband. And he was about 30 and I was about 60. We'd go into the dining room and write a little bit. And then we'd go in the living room and see if it worked. And it was interesting because we'd fight since he was 30. He didn't know what it was like to be 60 and be overlooked and be diminished and have people not walk right through you and not see you. Mm -hmm. And it was, we really made a wonderful play called changing shoes that went all over the country hello all over you went to boston you went to houston dallas where all did you go with this fantastic tour oh Cleveland, Pittsburgh, Florida, Palm Beach. When we were in Houston, President George H.W. and Barbara Bush were there. She walked in and I heard the whole theater hush up. They'd come to see me backstage because a friend of mine is yes. kind of there. And she walked in and you heard silence. Then he walked in about five minutes later and everybody stood up and clapped. I knew I could do everything perfect that night. Right. <laughs> I mean, there was no way I wasn't going to do that. Everybody was going to be so happy with it. But we went to Cincinnati. We went to Toronto. I did a little bit of it in London. But I was going to do it in Paris. 
This is fascinating. But it was, remember the nightclub that the terrorists killed everybody in? Yes, it was a concert going on at the time. Yes, I remember right. that. October, early November was when it was. And I was going to do it after that. And they called and said, there's no way you can do this as an American. Wow. And they were right. I mean, everybody was terrified. But I would have loved to have done it in Paris. Yes, <laughs> Absolutely. That would have been so much fun. Then did the book come after? Yes, the book came out. Here's a good one. 60 Minutes did a special on us. Were you aware of that? Of Guiding Light? Yeah. Sure, Going yes. Off. You know, it was a real tribute to the show because we were the longest running show in history ever. Nobody's going to run that long without reruns. We were 72 years. Right, because I understand it started as a radio program, yes, and then... And then morphed into 10 minutes and then 15 and then a half hour. Then I think even 45 before an hour. So they did that wonderful, wonderful show. And I was between Obama and Ted Kennedy, our little segment. The next day, my agent had me going to meet different publishers. Well, I walked in and they'd all watch 60 Minutes the night before. <laughs> there was a bidding war for that book. You know, you beg for good timing. That was the yes. best timing you could have. Literally, we were going Monday morning at 10 o'clock or whatever to these four or five places that were interested in the book and they wanted to meet me and then they all bid on it. I think one of them didn't, but three of them did. It was just fabulous. And I thought, well, this is the way life is, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Serendipity on life. steroids. Yes. Let's talk about, after Guiding Light closed, you did several projects. Well, I, I did lots of movies while yes. Guiding Light was going on. Jordan Clark, who played Billy, and Justin would say, where are you going? I'd say, oh, I have an audition. I come in the next day. Did you get it? Yep. I just was able. I went, oh, you know, you have good times in your life where you're really lucky. And I did a couple of Woody Allens. And for Woody Allen, the first one I did was Celebrity. And everyone said, don't talk to him under any circumstances. Do not talk to him. So I walk in and I say, Woody, I know your father, which I did because he was a great friend of the jeweler who lived down the street from where I live. And I'd drop in the jeweler and get my earrings fixed or whatever needed being fixed. And this man was always sitting there and he said to me, oh, my son's in show business. And I never paid any attention. And one day he said, well, you know, my son Woody. And I went, your son Woody? Woody Allen? He went, yes. I, so Whoa. I told Woody that story. <laughs> I love that. I said, yeah. And he loved it too. He came out from behind the pillar and, you know, talked to me about it. So, you know, it's sometimes I think we can't obey all the rules all the time. Right. Because if I'd listened to those people and been afraid of saying anything to Woody, I would have just been another person. But this way, I wasn't just another person. I was a person his father liked. <laughs> there you go. And then you did another Woody Allen movie. It was The Curse of the Jade Scorpion? It's Scorpion, yes. Okay. Yes. And that was fun. I did that with Woody. I mean, he and I had a little scene. And that was just fascinating. Let's talk about Changing Lanes. You played Ben Affleck's oh, mother-in-law. Fun. Yeah, that was fun. He walked in and I took my breath away. He was so handsome. He's devastating. Wow. He's just uh, so good looking. And Amanda Peet was my daughter. And the reason they had me, and who was my husband? Look, oh, Sidney Pollack. Sidney Pollack. Sydney yes, Pollock. Yeah. loved him. My husband's telling me this. He's sitting in the same <laughs> room working. Thank heaven he's here. Right. Sidney Pollack. So I got a call to go for an audition. And it was to be sort of a very ditzy woman because it was right after 9-11 had happened and that movie was about to come out but it was very dark and they couldn't do a dark movie. They had to have a happy ending. So I come in and the scene in a restaurant in New York, which is a really good scene I must say. The man who wrote it said to me, I said, well, what am I going to say? He said, I'm just going to talk the way you talk and I'm just going to have you go in and just do it the way you would talk because you've been so entertaining this entire audition. <laughs> and he never gave me any lines. He just said, talk to me and I just talked to him and that was it. And he wrote the ditzy woman. It was hysterical. That was really, really fun. And Sidney Pollack and Ben Affleck were talking about who had the bigger plane, I think. It was really <laughs> cute. And then I did, oh, I did The Guru with Heather Graham and Marissa Tomei. If you haven't seen that movie, that is a terrific movie. So I did that, and then I did... And you did People I Know with Al Pacino. Oh, with Al Pacino. That was just so much fun. I'll never forget what he did. He said, Tina, after we did our little scene, he said, we can do your close-ups first. Would you mind staying and doing mine? And I remember I said to him, oh, I can go to the market, or I could go to the shoe shine shop, or what could I do instead of being with Al Pacino? <laughs> He was so cute. He was just lovely. I mean, he treated you as though you were gold and you were this little tiny person. And he's this god. Oh, he was wow. just absolutely perfect. Okay, what else did I do? I there was have... an episode of Law & Order SVU because it's one of my favorite shows and the rerun was on. And I took a picture of you on screen and sent it to you saying, you're on the show. You know. I think I've used that picture many times because I think it's part of my little stash of pictures when people say, yeah. what have you done? And I send that picture. Yeah, but that was a great yeah, job too. You. you played a madam. Madam. On the same street that I live on. And it right. was on my birthday, and it was so cold, so cold. It was so interesting, too, because on so if you don't get it perfectly, word perfectly, it's just fine. But on that show, you had to have every single word exactly. 
exactly as it was written. So, of course, I'd learned the script and thought I knew it perfectly, but I knew it perfectly in Soapdom. I didn't know it perfectly in Law and Orderdom, which is really, really, the writers have the starring role there. I mean, you couldn't say the if it was at, at a door. No, no, at the door. You know, I mean, it was very interesting. I do love that show, and I thought you were fantastic in it. And I wanted to talk to you about a movie that you did called Happy New Year with a great guy, Michael Como. And he, by the way, on a side note, you know, we all follow each other on Instagram. He is a fantastic photographer. He is. No, you're right. He is. He has a great eye. When he got ready for that movie, he was in a wheelchair. I mean, he wasn't really, but he put himself in a wheelchair, wheeled himself around New York, down into the subways, really learned what it was like to be without legs or crippled, not able to walk. Sure. So that when he came in to do the movie, he never spoke to anyone. He just stayed by himself. He stayed in his wheelchair. He was astonishing. He was just the best thing in the world. I'll never speak so highly of anyone as I will of him. He was the best actor I've ever acted with. And when I went for my audition in Brooklyn, I remember, I went in and I played the mother of a Marine who's wounded. Well, of course, my son was in the Marines, so this was not a hard <laughs> jump for me at all. I was able to sure. pull that one. And he said, the minute you walked in and I saw your face, look at me, I knew you had to do the part because I felt what it would be like, obviously. I loved doing that movie. I was doing Black Swan at the same time with Natalie Portman. Right. And Happy New Year, we shot up in the Bronx in a mental institution. They gave us a floor. <laughs> Whoa. I know. I drive in in my old green Jaguar, but it looked really good. And I drive in in that. And then I looked around at where I was and I called upstairs and I said, could you have someone come down to me? Really, really scary. I mean, really scary. Not just a little scary. It was really scary. So they would and they'd walk me out at night <laughs> into my green Jaguar. And then I'd go do Black Swan. You know, I mean, it was just fascinating. I, but they were different days or something. I was able to pull it off. I probably made $100 a day on Happy New Year, which I gave right back to them pretty much. They needed every every penny. People, they read the script and they gave them the insane asylum as a free place to do it. You know, I mean, it was such an important movie. I think it's the most important movie I may have ever seen. And I agree with you. If I could share, because I know your interview was all about me, but this is a story I tell all the time about Happy New Year. When I went with a friend to a fundraiser that was showing Happy New Year and you were there with the cast, there was a dinner, sir, well, not a dinner, more of a buffet style. Then the cast was interviewed and then we watched the film. Well, one of the things that they were serving was Beef Wellington. And I love Beef Wellington. And so me being so cool, I took a few of the Beef Wellington, I guess you call them rolls or pastries, and wrapped them in a napkin and put them in my coat pocket so I could nibble while I was watching the movie. But Tina, the movie was so damn good, I forgot about the Beef Wellington. Now that is saying something when Ello forgets about food. Especially Beef Wellington for a movie. I mean, I was completely blown away by it. And still sitting there when the question and answers are going on, I was going, well, I still need time to process that. I don't know who the DP was, but even in, you know, you say it was shot in a sane asylum, you know, the shadows and light that they worked with, even yes. in the daytime, yes. it was still haunting. Not a sane asylum haunting, but just, you know. No, no, he was genius, I think. He really was. And of course, everybody was doing it. I mean, some people had to be paid, but everybody was doing it for as little money as they could possibly make to live on. One of the girlfriends would make lunch for everybody every day. They'd come in and they'd bring in these little bit of pasta. <laughs> you know, it was just, and then you'd go down to Black Swan and there'd be bays and <laughs> evening gowns and <laughs> diamond tiaras. The truth is, I mean, that movie, people, they couldn't move when it was over. And I think they'd say to other people, don't see it. It's just too much. I mean, I really, to this day, want to always bring them down to Florida, have a movie showing. I tried to do it where I live in Florida. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, I don't know if that language is going to go over. Well, now it probably wouldn't matter because we're in a different time. And I wanted to talk about the show Venice. I had met you right when you were starting filming that. That was one of the first all streaming, completely online shows, from what I understand. I think it was. I think they even won, I want to say, a daytime Emmy or an Emmy or something for what they did with this. I mean, for bringing this into the world. It's you know? so great. So tell us about your character and how it looks like a bunch of the Guiding Light cast got back together. Well, let me tell you how it started. Absolutely. We were out and Crystal Chappelle and I were saying, okay, what are our next steps? Nobody else is thinking about it, but we're we're both thinking, okay, there has to be some next steps now. The show's going off. We found out April Fool's Day it was going to go off. I'd been writing that book, and I'd been writing the play, and the Changing Shoes play went on the day after Guiding Light stopped. It went to Cape May, New Jersey, and did the first play. So that and it was wonderful. I mean, Grand and Mikey, everybody came to it from Guiding Light because it was a way to sort of celebrate the new beginnings for us all. So Crystal and I are 
sitting in a room at one point, and she said, I'm going to have to think of something. This was before we'd gone off. There were two women. It was the first time I think they had two women fall in love on TV. I could be wrong, but I think it was the first time. But Procter and Gamble wouldn't let them kiss each other. They were allowed to hold hands, but they weren't allowed to kiss. I think I have that right. And Crystal said, all right, this huge, huge population of women who are thrilled by this, having smart women, they're showing beautiful, smart women falling in love with each other. And she said, I'm going to do a series about this. I'm going to get Jessica and we'll start it off the two of us in bed. I'll never forget. We were walking down the hallway and I said, uh, can I be in this? And she said, sure you can. Of course you can. And I don't think I said it like that. I think she said, and if you want to do it, you can be in it. I said, yeah, I want to do it. And the first one, I couldn't be out there. I was doing the play in New York or somewhere. So they brought some people from California and we shot some of it in my apartment in the first episode. Really? Hillary, Hillary Brady Smith. If you ever see episode one, it's hysterical. She's a fortune teller. She comes to my living room and she is doing her cards. And my husband has just died. And I'm not in real life. This is on TV. Sure. I mean, on, in the story. And she's doing my cards and she says, oh, I see someone coming into your life. I said, well, when will he come? And she looks at me and she goes, he's not a he, it's a she. And wow. I go, oh. and every woman loved it because my reaction was so funny. It, <laughs> I see it now and I, I must say it's one of my favorite scenes because I'm going, what? And indeed, I have, I fall in love with a man who's Michael, who is Crystal Chappelle's real life husband. Really? Wow. I'm very wealthy and yeah. he's trying to get all my money. And then he dies and I, everyone says, I think I might have done it. But it, she really did something fabulous here. Then she did a show on the character on a soap opera that she played gets Alzheimer's and Jessica, who the woman she was in love with on Guiding Light and in Venice, takes care of her. They're in the same show in this movie. Mm-hmm. She made a movie. Of, it's very, very good. It's really... A Million Happy Nows. So terrific. And then these women came to her to do Beacon Hill. And they did it one year, and I did it. And it's really, really fun. It's a political thing. Although I'm in a coffee shop with my partner, and we are sort of the gossip of all time, which is, it's very funny. It's a very good series, but it's also very funny. I mean, our part, my part, and Louise who plays I'm is that the actress louise sorrell yeah okay yeah what a great combination um, you guys must be oh we are so funny we really are and they love us being funny so we get to go away with it so i mean it's crystal who started all this because she's done this two series even though she didn't write beacon hill but she's directed part of it she's in it and i don't think she's producing it but maybe she is and so you're doing all that and then here comes covid how have you been with not being able to see a lot of family. Of course, you have two new grandchildren now. You have the little girl. She's three now. Six. Oh, my God, two. Tina. Almost, oh, my gosh. Three. I know what happened. I see your nieces and nephews. They've grown so much. I can't they believe They do. It. They do. And every time I turn around, I'm going, what are you doing? Stop feeding them. <laughs> they have to stay small. So <laughs> your granddaughter is six and your grandson is three? He'll be three in October. Oh, my mm-hmm. gosh. We used to see them all the time. I mean, yes. we had an apartment where they live. And they came at Christmas. And then they were coming up in March to Florida. And this whole COVID thing came out. And our doctor, because we're not young, said, you can't do this. You can't travel. And the kids, they shouldn't come. So they didn't. And then they were telling you to stay off planes. You know, it was just awful. Tina, tell us the difference between being a parent and being a grandparent for you. Oh, I mean, I'm just so, I mean, I adored my son. But being a grandparent was just all-encompassing. I mean, we literally moved to Chevy Chase, Maryland to be near them. And there we picked them up at school. I mean, we lived in Florida, but we'd spend September, October, November there and the summers. And this year, of course, we couldn't do any of it. But all we wanted to do was be with them. The other day, my little grandson, who hasn't seen Steve except on FaceTime for a year, was on the floor and his mother taped this and sent it to Steve, my husband. And she said, Mather, what are you doing? And he said, I'm writing a note. And she said, who to? And she said, granddad. And she said, oh, what are you going to say? And he looked at her and said, well, I'd like to take it over to his house and give it to him because she hasn't seen him in so long. Uh And I just broke our hearts, but it was so sweet. And I almost can't think about it. It's like when my son was in Iraq in the Marines. I just didn't let myself think about it because you love these children Mm -hmm. so much, so much. And Tina, finally, let's talk about Chasing Cleopatra. Please take me. Yes, exactly. (laughs) It is a fantastic read. It is smooth, but yet you do have to stop and go over going, wow, that just happened. Take me through your first inspiration for Cleo all the way through to the end of your process. I dreamt the triangle. I don't want to give it away to anybody listening to it, but you know what I'm talking about, the trip triangle. And years and years and years ago, and it happened on a beach that she was with a Jake character and bumped into the trip character. I showed it to Nan Talese, who's, she has 
her own imprimatur, and she's got Ian McHugh and Margaret Atwood, fabulous people. She's now 87 or 8. She's about to retire, but she said to me, you need some danger in it. So I thought, danger? Because, you know, it was sort of a romance novel of love and betrayal, and that was it. Right. Um, I then introduced a terrorist, a homegrown, in a sense, terrorist. And my son had been in Iraq in intelligence in 2006 and 2008. And so he had a lot of black op friends, and I had a friend who had been the former head of the CIA. So I was able to call on people who knew a lot about this and get really interesting twists and thoughts about it. I mean, the whole book takes place, as you know, in Honolulu, and I wanted to know where near there there would have been a very good al-Qaeda. I used al-Qaeda because that's who my son was working against when he was in Iraq. So I wanted to find out, and I was told to the Philippines and exactly where in the Philippines, which is where I had the training camp. And it was just, I began to really enjoy doing this. And of course, no one knows who the terrorist is. You didn't guess, did you? I did not. Uh You know, I I don't want to give away any clue, but... No, I, I, know, I had no idea. Thing. I had no and idea. nobody I know has guessed it. No one. You know, one person who said she reads books constantly and always knows what's going on didn't get that. And that made me very, very happy because I wanted to hide it. But if you read it again, it's kind of it's fun to read again. Yes. Especially in quarantine. People like to get out of themselves for a while. And you'll see the little hints that I dropped throughout. But anyway, and everyone thought that it would just be someone who wasn't in the book, who wasn't part of the book. Right. And they were kind of surprised that it was someone in the book. So when I added him to it, I think it that that whole story being very much part of the book was terribly important, I thought. So that's how it all sort of came about in Cleo, being because of what had happened to her as a child, Mm -hmm. um, learning Krav Maga. All of it played into it somehow. And, you know, I had to study about Krav Maga. I've had to study about so many things during this that I love learning about. And that probably when you're reading the book for the plot, you don't see, but it adds to the book. When the helicopter ride and the birds and and Matt, the son who's so, who has... Asperger's. Yeah, a bit of Asperger's. But because of it, a lot of times Asperger's Asperger's people see something that nobody else sees. And I loved having him find a very important part of the whole book. I loved him becoming, he may be one of my favorite characters. I loved him finding out things that nobody else could figure out. And I thought that was intriguing. And he did it with a glance after someone had been, again, not giving it away, someone had been studying something and he walked up and went, oh, hey, look at that. Yes, he knew right away what it was. Exactly. I loved that. So there was a lot of research in it. It was so much fun to do. And people have said they couldn't put the book down, that it just gets you. And of course, during this period, it's a wonderful time to have a book that you don't want to put, carries you away out of reality for hours or days. And so that made me very happy. It made me really happy. The process of her, there was Miranda, who you meet early on, who's the mother of Jake, who you meet right at the start, Right, was not a character that I liked very much. She and Julia, I didn't like. And then Miranda would wake me up at night and she'd say things like, I was a cheerleader. And I'd go, oh no, I have to learn about cheerleading. <laughs> you know? So I'd go and try and figure that out. But the characters did sort of tell me and lead me into places, which was the most interesting part of it, I think. That they'd wake you up and you'd be writing them and you'd go, my gosh, this is what she does or this is what he does. Oh, my goodness. And you're sort of stunned. I mean, I didn't know that Ricky was going to, well, you find this out really on, so I can say it, be in love with Julia, his brother's girlfriend. Right. But it sort of happened. All of a sudden, I realized that he was. I didn't even know it. I didn't plot this. The characters kind of plotted it, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And that's the most organic, wonderful process that you have. And again, with Miranda, I want to say to all the listeners, I love the format of your book because each chapter is that character from their perspective. You know what I mean? Chapter one is Cleo. Chapter two is Miranda. And so you get their perspective right away. You do sometimes go back and go, you know, when Miranda says, I I won't give it away, but Miranda says, oh, I want orange juice. Then Trip will go, I wonder why Miranda wanted orange juice. Of course, that's not in the thing, but get his perspective too, because she just wanted orange juice. You don't have to put 19 layers in it. Yeah. You know, but he's thinking, okay, I'm three moves ahead of her. And she's going, I just want some damn orange juice. But right. she's also the one, when you said you didn't like her, when she first came on the scene, I went, oh, great. Here's the mom, you know, with the zinc oxide right. at the beach. But she was the one that went, oh, I've got you all figured out. I'm not going to say anything. And the scene with, again, not giving it away, you know, she's not a wallflower. And, and then on... Um, she's not. 
No, I think Miranda, she says early on, I play checkmate. I wait until I've won, and then I speak. Right. I just watch. I thought she was going to be a boring mother, and she was anything but boring. She was fascinating. And Julie was going to be a sweet little girlfriend, and she was anything but a sweet little girlfriend. Everybody right. took on different colors and lots of different colors in the midst of a really dangerous threat to the country, which nobody knew about. It was so fun to write it. And mostly people will call me in the middle of the night when they finish at 2.30 or say, you're keeping me awake all night. I couldn't put the thing down. I've got three children. I'm going to be up at 6 a.m. <laughs> but it was such a ride. I'm having so much fun. I went back and read it after getting a lot of letters from people thanking me for a few days out of the COVID reality. It just made me feel so good because I went and read it and I had fun again. You put in, the, you know, several characters and I'm going, ooh, what are they up to? But they were, you know, again, red herring. yeah, red herrings, but they still were essential to the story. So Tina Sloan chasing Cleopatra. Where can one acquire chasing Cleopatra? Well, any bookstore, if you go into any bookstore and ask for Chasing Cleopatra, they can order it. And Amazon has it, of course. <laughs> they have everything, don't they? But I, you know, I, we all want the small bookstores, obviously. But mm -hmm. these days, Amazon delivers it. Well, I can't thank you enough, Tina, for spending time with us. And Chasing Cleopatra, go get it today. Yeah, well, thank you for loving it so much. I have such gratitude when someone is excited about it. And people are, but you expressed it so well, and I'm very grateful for that. Absolutely. Tina Sloan, thank you. This has been Elocution with your host, Elo Black.